and start that. All right, we are also recording. Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Derek Demeter. I'm with the Emil Beeler Planetarium. Uh, as you can see, we have some really incredible guests with us today for our episode four of the virtual star party. Uh, to my left here, you'll have um, a gentleman from the uh, Holstrom Planetarium. He's the Planetarium Director, uh, John Bell, looking really snazzy tonight. And then over here to my right, we have a man in, uh, in darkness, in shadow, uh, he is the planetary manager at the uh, Museum of Science and History in Jacksonville. That's Brett Jacobs. Uh, on the bottom, this, I feel like we're in Brady Bunch right now. Um, and uh, <laughs> and to my uh, bottom left here, we have a gentleman, James Albury. He is the planetary manager at the Kika Silva Pla Planetarium at Santa Fe College in Gainesville. In the centerpiece, we have a gentleman, Seth Mayo. He is the astronomy curator and runs the planetarium at the Museum of Science, Arts and Science uh, over in Daytona Beach. And you all know Frank Kane, our amazing telescope engineer. He returns with some special extra solar vision. And at the very bottom, we have our amazing communications officer and commander, Justin Cirillo. And Good evening. He is going to be our communications between you all and us. Uh, and if you have any questions or anything for us, please go ahead and um, uh, you know, leave a question there. Justin will relay that to all of our fellow friends tonight. And uh, so we have our, we're going to be exploring a lot of interesting things. A lot of these gentlemen you see here have some very, very unique um, knowledge and some expertise. And we're very fortunate to have all of them join us today. We call it the Flanter Florida Planetariums Unite. That's what we're doing tonight. And uh, uh, Frank, um, unfortunately, you have told me that it is currently here in Florida socked in. Is that a technical uh, word for being cloudy in the plant in the astronomy? Yes, world? that is the technical term for super cloudy. In fact, I think it might rain any minute here. So uh, all right. Well, we don't want the telescope getting wet uh, and rain and poured on. Uh, but you have have you have some really amazing photos taken with that telescope uh, that you're going to share tonight while we explore. Right? Is that is that correct? That's right. I got a collection right. of photos of the parts of the sky we're going to be talking about and uh, can show you some pretty pictures as we go. Fantastic. You know, pretty pictures are always a very important thing. Brett has teleported uh, in the uh, image here. Uh, he, I didn't know you had those tele teleportation abilities, Brett. <laughs> but you do. That's incredible. You do, you do travel power. at the speed of laser, right? Is that, is that how That's you right. That's right. I'm laser fast. Yeah, he is a laser fanatic. This man does some really great laser stuff. If you ever get a chance to go there, go check it out. And I'm going to give all of you a chance to talk about your planetariums as well and some of the things that you have to offer. We'll be doing that throughout the show. Now, Seth, you have a special gift tonight. You are not only a pilot of the cosmos, but you are actually a pilot, right? You are you, yes. you graduated from Embry-Riddle, uh, and you are somebody who actually can fly a plane. So you are, by right now, bestowed to be the cosmological uh, not the cosm cosmetological, not, we're not cutting hair today, uh, <laughs> but you are going to be piloting our vehicle of the stars tonight. You are the operator of the I'm stars. ready. I've been training my whole life for this very moment. At this very moment in time, you have trained your entire life. Yes. I, I'm, really, I'm really excited about what you have to offer tonight, Seth. Thank you. And thank you for piloting our spacecraft. Uh, even though Justin looks like he's ready to fly with that space helmet of his, he's, that's actually a uh, a communications beacon that allows him to tune into the cosmos in all frequencies. Uh, so, um, all right, gentlemen, are you ready to begin exploring the night sky? I am. Is everyone oh, yes. else? All right, John. Yeah, um, John Bell, are you excited? <laughs> are you really excited? I, 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 I'm questioning your excitement tonight. I'm, I'm not really about excitement. I'm just about just the facts, you know. Oh, uh, he's with he's just the facts. He's and the tradition. All right. <laughs> I'm a very traditional sort of a person. All right. Okay, excellent. He is just the facts, folks. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and begin our exploration of the night sky tonight. Um, and uh, to do that, uh, Seth, we're going to go ahead and have you share your screen, and we're going to go ahead and take we'll a look at some of the interesting things in the sky. I think what we should start off with our exploration of the cosmos tonight, um, and uh, let me know when you're ready, Seth. Yep. We will move on to my screen. And real right. quick, I'll just tell you that this is a, a software called Stellarium. And uh, us in the planetarium community and even for the general public, it's a very useful technology that anyone can download on their computer for free. 
So if you see, I can kind of fly around Whoa. and look at the sky anywhere we want, anytime from any place on earth. And so I've been using this for many, many years to explore the universe, to look at the sky, to kind of figure out what is out and to kind of, uh, to get ready for celestial events that are going right. on. So, yep. Sounds great. And um, <clears throat> we have a lot to look at tonight. And uh, what, where we should start off is one of the most uh, beautiful things you're gonna see as the sun sets. And do we have a little bit of a time stamp here? Right now we're at, it uh, looks like 8.36. Right down so, here, yeah. Uh, yeah, a little bit, a little bit earlier, it looks like. But uh, right after sunset, you're going to see this incredibly bright star over in the west. Uh, now, Brett, um, you are the planetary man tonight. Can you tell us a little bit about what that object is that we see in the uh, night sky? That, of course, is Venus, and it's pretty, uh, actually, pretty easy to tell the difference between planets and stars too. Um, everyone knows the song "Twinkle Twinkle Little Star." Well. It doesn't say twinkle, twinkle, little planet for a reason. Planets are nice pinpoints, solid brights. And this is the third brightest natural object in the sky, so it really sticks out. Um, you're going to see it before it even gets dark. Um, I mean, we're only at 830 here. You go out right now, you'll see it up there, and it just kind of screams at you. Um, and it's, it's bright for a couple of reasons. It's very close to us compared to other planets, and it's about the same size as the Earth, actually. It's a little smaller. So big nearby means a lot of light bouncing off of it comes our way. The reason it's bouncing off light is because it's covered with these clouds. Um, can we see a up close of Venus zoom here? In, Seth, we have the ability to zoom in, don't we? We have the yes. ability to engage our uh, telescopic view of Venus. We will zoom and engage. Right. Look at that. There it is. Right to yeah. it. There we What's go. really cool is it, it's a crescent. <laughs> well, because Venus is closer to the sun than where it does sometimes get in between the Earth and the sun. So the nighttime side is mostly facing us, and of course that crescent side is the daytime side. And it's covered with these kind of really bright clouds and reflect about 75% of the light that it gets from the sun. So it, it's a very, very bright object. Now, you might not really hear anything about visiting Venus with humans anyway, and part of the reason is those clouds, well, that, that, that's sulfuric acid basically in the clouds. And that's not even the bad part, it's the rest of the atmosphere is, well, carbon dioxide and like 95% or so is carbon dioxide, and we know that's bad. And this is an extreme bad, because we've all heard about the greenhouse effect, and this is kind of an extreme one. That carbon dioxide traps almost all the heat it's getting from the sun, which means the temperature ranges between ooh, 800 at night to about 1,000 during the day. I, I like to say that's kind of like Florida during the summertime, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's a dry heat. <laughs> but it's a dry heat, yeah. <laughs> and, and you don't want that rain to hit you there. No, um, definitely not. Yeah, <laughs> but it has no moons of its own, and we'll we'll be. See, it's actually been seeing it for like the past what six months, almost well, now. Quite a while since, now. Since yeah, October, October. October. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. It, it's been up there for a while, and it's yes. gonna go away soon. Three months left. <laughs> uh, but it's one of the real easiest things to see. In fact, this is probably the one question that almost all of us get asked a lot: "Is I saw this bright dot in the sky. What was it?" <laughs> it's, it's almost a UFO, always Venus. Right? <laughs> so, you, you know, a time frame or a direction, it's almost always Venus. We can always guess that. And I, I figured a real simple way, you know, if it twinkles, it's a star. If it's a pinpoint, it's a dot. And if it moves around a lot, that's a UFO. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't know. It could be a Delta or United Airlines. Yeah. Well, if I don't know what it is, it's a UFO. <laughs> right. The definition, it's not identified. But once you're it's right. It's an IFO. <laughs> So, um, so John, uh, you thank you, Brett, very much for your information about Venus. John, uh, you, you are kind of the man of the classics, uh, learning about some of the really interested in expressing uh, the history and culture of these objects in the sky. Can you tell a little bit about some of the, the, the mythology or the history of Venus? Sure. Uh, Venus, of course, is named for the Roman goddess of love and beauty. Uh, the Greek uh, par parallel to that is Aphrodite. And uh, so because it is such a beautiful sight that we see, it's, it was thought to be the most beautiful planet to look at. Uh, and uh, that's why it's got that name. If you look at the features on the planet, the, the mountains, the volcanoes, the impact craters, and the river valleys, well, they're not rivers of water, they're rivers of lava. But all these features are named for uh, women uh, either mythology, for example, there are two continents on Venus. 
there's no water on Venus because at 900 Fahrenheit, water isn't going to exist in liquid form, but there are highlands and these two continents, let's call them, are Aphrodite, Terra, and Ishtar, Terra. Ishtar is the Babylonian goddess of love. And then those water features are named for more characters from legend mythology. There's a Guinevere, and also historical people. There's a Sacagawea, there is Mead for Margaret Mead. Uh, there is, um, I was looking up the list. Uh, there's no Franklin for uh, Rosalind Franklin for some reason. So I might suggest that for another feature there. There's, uh, what else is there? There's uh, Cleopatra. Uh, you know what there isn't though? There, there's no Hillary. No Hillary. No Hillary. And that's for two reasons. Number one, if you are a person, uh, a woman, uh, you must have been dead for three years and uh, they're not choosing anybody from politics or government. It's only people who've done arts and uh, nice. things like that. I mean, there's uh, uh, singers, performers, uh, guys, people who've done those different things. Uh, they've been naming them for uh, women uh, since about 1991. They were doing a few before that. I'm not sure the last countries I see are from about 10 years ago. But now, are there women? Are there any women possible. astronomers uh, named on Venus? Yes, and I would uh, I would say that you would go to the International Astronomical Union and make your suggestions to them. Okay. All right, and so so as you see, Venus is uh, definitely a really unique place in the solar system, and uh, there's a lot of different interesting features to check out. Uh, and thankfully, we've been able to do that using uh, spacecraft like Magellan. Uh, and that been able to pierce through those thick clouds on Venus. So again, look to Venus tonight around, um, you know, right after sunset, you'll see that very bright object in the sky. Now, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a quick shout out at, at, kind of before, at, during the time we kind of move on to different objects, we'll do a quick shout out to some of these planets, some of our planetarium friends here tonight. And we're gonna start with, uh, because Brett, you started off uh, as the first one. Uh, we're gonna give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about your facility and some of the things that you do. Keep it short, but uh, tell us all the cool <laughs> things you're doing there. Sure, um, I'm the planetarium manager of the Brian Gooding Planetarium inside the Museum of Science and History, Jacksonville, Florida. Um, obviously, we're not doing much right now, but we do plan on getting back on. We're actually doing some online stuff as well. All of our science educators, actually. Um, we're doing our first um, star show, very much like this Sunday night, um, and making a bunch of lesson plans like that. But when we get back to normal, um, we do shows every single day. We do a star live star show every single day that we are open. Of course, we are known for our laser shows, and we do a lot of other, um, uh, I guess you could say, out there stuff, which kind of makes sense in a planetarium. Like uh, One of my favorite events we do is we actually have yoga in the planetarium once a month, and it sells out. <laughs> and it's a lot of fun because we have the stars up, and they're slowly moving. It's a, kind of a cool atmosphere. Um, and that's just like one of the many, many things that we do in our planetarium, and one that's a lot of fun too. Nice. Um, we, yeah. You can go to our website for more, themosh.org. All right, mosh.org. You heard it from him, and then Justin's going to go ahead and put these links into the uh, Facebook comments, uh, so that way you can check those out, and also be sure to follow them on their social media and their website as well. All right, so let's go ahead and continue on with our tour. And I think what we should do is we should talk about one of the most prevalent or some of the, one of the more brighter constellations, one, one that a lot of people usually see. And it's only up for just a few more uh, weeks, it feels like, until it's getting to the point where it's just not visible. This is a late fall, early winter constellation for most to see it in, a, in, a, in an, an average time in the sky. And so what we're going to look here is we look to the west. Um, you're going to start to pick out a group of stars. And uh, James, you are the man of the stargazer. You have followed Jack Horkheimer, which was a famous, uh, you know, uh, man in the 70s and 80s and, and, and 90s. You kind of created this PBS special called Stargazer. Actually, it was called Star Hustler back in the day before they changed it to Stargazer. Uh, yeah. And you have kind of ranked now the title of the man who teaches about the stars. So I'm going to let you have the opportunity to introduce our next constellation, some of the things you can see in it. Okay. So, uh, yes, I'm James, and welcome. So we're going to go for the obvious one, which is Orion the Hunter. 
So you'll see him just a little bit to the west-southwest. He's made up of seven bright stars you can easily see from a local city or any city that you're in. So we'll start off at the bottom at the right. That's Rigel. That marks his foot. And you can see the information on our screen that that star is uh, pretty far away from us. So it's very bright in order for it to be able to, for us to be able to see it from that far away. It's over 800 light years away. And then uh, up to the left of it, uh, toward the southwest, is Safe. So there we go. And Safe marks his knee if you're to draw him. And then, of course, the obvious area, you have the belt of three stars. Starting from the left, you have Alma Tak, Alma Lam is in the middle, and then Mantaka is the far right. And those three stars, from our perspective in the galaxy, they look like they're lined up. But if you were anywhere else in the galaxy, either 100 light years to the left or the right, the star in the middle, Alnilam, is actually further from us than the other two. And then at the upper right, we have Bellatrix. And those of you who are Harry Potter fans may recognize that name because uh, J.K. Rowling, when she wrote the Harry Potter series, uh, she liked to give members of the Black family names of stars. So Bellatrix Lestrange, that's uh, where her name came from. And then everyone's favorite star over the last several months particularly is Betelgeuse. And Betelgeuse is a red supergiant nearing the end of its life. And for quite a while, um, over the last few months, it had dimmed. But we thought, oh, well, maybe it's gone supernova. But recent uh, studies have shown that it has gotten brighter, and we believe that there was a major outgassing event uh, at Betelgeuse, that and when the gas expanded, it, it became more opaque. So we couldn't see Betelgeuse as well as we normally do, but that has now dissipated, so Betelgeuse is back at its, almost its normal brightness, but it dropped by almost a full magnitude uh, from September to latter part of December, or part of January. That's pretty wild. Right. Yeah. Now, below Orion's belt, if you look at Rigel and Safe, and you see Alan Attack, that first star, if you, if you form a triangle with those three right in the middle there, you'll see this fuzzy patch right there. That is the Sword of Orion, also known as the Great Nebula of Orion. And if you zoom in on that, you'll notice that there is a fuzzy patch there. That is a very large nebula. Sometimes we call that an H2 region. But in that area, there are brand new stars that are being born. And that nebula is 30 light years in diameter, which means that if, it, if we were in it, there'd be a lot of other stars in the nebula with us. And if you took all of that material and made it into solar systems, you could make over 10,000 stars the size of our sun. And if you go, uh, step, zoom out just a little bit, look under Alnitak, uh, just up. Now, those of you who have telescopes as well, zoom in on that star, that fuzzy patch, the reddish patch near Alnilam, over to the left there. You see that? For those of you who've always wondered where the horse head nebula is, it's right there. And that was discovered by Williamia Fleming, who was one of the uh, astronomers who worked at the Harvard Observatory with Annie Jump Cannon and Henrietta Leavitt, and they cataloged over 250,000 stars back in the early part of the 20th century, and she is the one who is credited with discovering the Horsehead Nebula. And we call it the Horsehead Nebula because it looks like the head of a horse. If you saw a nebula look like a chicken, we call it the Chicken Nebula, and we put it in all your science books. So, <laughs> so. so uh, Frank, you have some images that you've taken with your telescope of some of the objects that James mentioned. Um, do you happen to show us some of those uh, those images you've taken of these objects? Actually, Seth, we'll go ahead and have you unshare for a second. And, yeah, I think uh, I can steal and, the screen uh, here. Frank, we'll have you share real quick. Let's take a look at some of these images. So that's right. uh, one of our images there taken with uh, our, this would be the same telescope we would have used tonight if it was clear, correct? That's right, same scope we've been using in past episodes, and uh, you might remember from episode one, we looked at the Orion Nebula, but uh, this is the Horsehead and Flame Nebula near the star Al Natak, which is that leftmost star in Orion's belt, right? And um, yeah, it's a good example of what you can see from suburbia here, even if you just have a long enough exposure. This is taken from Winter Springs, Florida, which is just on the suburbs of Orlando, and it's bright enough that uh, you can actually punch through the light pollution here and get a pretty decent image. That's incredible. And, and do you have an image of uh, the Orion Nebula for us to see? Uh, hang on, not handy, but uh, if you give me a second, let me... Uh... Do a little vamping. When you see that horse head there in profile, 
uh, you're looking at a nebula. It's uh, a nebula that doesn't happen to have any stars in it. The pink and the red that's behind all that, that is what they call an emission nebula. And it's shining, we can see it because there are stars in it that make, you, make it glow like a neon sign. But where the horse head is, that's another patch of cloud in the foreground that has not yet been lit up by those stars. So it's a real nice kind of a feel of three dimension when you look at that. And I don't, I don't know how you all feel about this, but um, it, to me, it looks more like a seahorse rather than an actual. Yeah, horse. I think so too. Um, and being Floridians, you know, I think seahorses are a little bit more, uh, you know, relevant. To, uh, so. Um, yeah, I have a really old picture of the Orion Nebula. This is actually uh, one of the very first astrophotos I ever took. So, you know, if you want to see what you can do as a beginner, <laughs> that's what you're up but against But you know, there. that looks a lot like what you would see through a telescope. If you were exactly, to look at a yeah. telescope, uh, a fairly modest telescope, this is what you would see. You'd see that trapezium. You'd see the brightest of the nebulosity poking out. So this gives you kind of a realistic approach to when, you know, when we see these beautiful pictures of nebulas, we won't see those with our eyes because that's a very faint light that's being collected for hours and hours. But when, but when it look at the Orion Nebula through a, a decent sized telescope or a small telescope, this is what's really gonna pop out the most are, is this brighter region located in the very center of the, uh, of the nebula. Yeah, and this is just a, literally sticking a camera up to the telescope and snapping a snapshot. So that is pretty much what you see through an and actual telescope. And that's absolutely impressive. Was this with a, uh, what kind of camera was it? Uh, Frank? It was just a Canon uh, T6i DSLR camera. So, you know, the exactly. kind of camera you might have kicking around the house. Exactly. So, you know, the, the technology of today is really, really wonderful. Um, now, John, uh, uh, Seth, we want to go ahead and share real quick again yep. some of the uh, 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 Orion. So, John Bell, uh, there are some really beautiful, interesting history and, and mythology associated with Orion, right? Actually, Seth, can we bring up the uh, the kind of classical drawings of the, of the constellation like Orion there? Sure, I'll put up the outline Ooh. here, and then we can also put up the artwork. Uh, there it is. Solarium right. provides. So most of the star names that James went through with us, uh, they're mostly Arabic in origin. Uh, the one exception is Bellatrix in his shoulder closest to the shield. Bellatrix is Latin. It literally means the fighting woman, which it translates to the Amazon star, like Bella, like belligerent me, Belligerent means fight, looking for a fight, and tricks, T-R-I-X, uh, for example, Amelia Earhart uh, was a, not an aviator, but an aviatrix, and so, oh, she's got a crater on uh, Venus too, by the way, and so that's what the, that is the Amazon star. But the other stars, for example, Al-Natak, Al-Nalam, Mintaka, they either mean the belt, the girdle, or a string of pearls along the girdle, uh, along the belt. Saif, S-A-I-P-H, or some people say, say safe or sight, it extends downward through the nebula. That means sword. So it's one of those cur swords or scimitars that are, mm -hmm. sometimes come from the belt. Although let's say he's got a hunting knife in this, in this rendition. Rigel means knee or kneecap. And Bellatrix means the armpit of the giant. Uh, we say the I shoulder of the giant is more romantic. Mm -hmm. And so those guys, really nice tradition. When you look for star names, the Arabic names typically tell you the part of the body you're looking at, which is a very neat way to, when you need to make a star chart, a neat way to be able to draw it. When I look at Orion here, he is in mythology, the son of Poseidon. And as you can see, he's uh, chasing over toward uh, the star Aldebaran there to his, uh, so it'd be to his left, to our right or west. Aldebaran means the follower because it follows after the Pleiades, right there, the star cluster. And Orion had a romantic interest in, uh, oh gosh, who was that? Was it Merope? Merope, I think, uh, one of the stars in there. But uh, Merope, uh, her dad didn't care for him. So he, he concocted this, oh, it's really strange, some uh, strange brew that caused him to lose his eyesight. And he had to go on a quest to restore his eyesight. And then he picked up with, um, um, with Diana or Artemis uh, later on. What's really interesting about this is he had a lot of adventures. You can see he's wearing uh, 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 something draped over one arm. It's supposed to be lion skin as a shield. And then the other arm, he's got a club. And the funny thing is, there are no stories uh, of Orion that talk about him using a club or having any fights with lions. Hmm. Uh, there was a hero uh, of uh, about the same antiquity, Hercules, 
he had a he had a lion cloaked over him. That was the Nemean lion, the first of his labors, and he used a club. Um, but probably what this is is both Orion and um, uh, Hercules came from a much older star figure, which was there, which was Gilgamesh from epic Babylonian mythology. Gilgamesh also fought bulls and he fought lions and he had a club. So what we're looking there is sort of um. The word is palimpsest. It means an overlaying of different cultures, one on top of another. You see that when you watch how cities are built on the ruins of the older city. And so this palimpsest, you've got, uh, you've got one Latin star name in there, you've got a Greek myth, and then you've got Arabic star names, and then you have things from Babylonia. That's how much culture and so much history and time has gone into this. And it's a good example to show you how we're connected to people not just in faraway lands, but also to people of long ago, because we see the same constellation of Orion as they did back then. And it's, it's a good connection, I think. It's pretty incredible uh, that there's so much history, so much of our traditions and our culture found in the stars. And no matter where you are on planet Earth, there is some heritage and some stories of the night sky. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump to another constellation. And before we do that, we're going to do another shout out. Um, this time we're going to talk uh, about Seth. Seth, tell us a little bit about your uh, planetarium. And uh, All right. Thanks. Thanks, Derek. And thanks for having me on this uh, awesome sure. virtual star party. Um, as Derek said, I am Seth Mayo, and I am the curator of astronomy for the Lowell and Nancy Lohman Family Planetarium. We have a new name. Uh, we just acquired this new name, so we're short for Lohman uh, Planetarium, but we are part of the Museum of Arts and Sciences in Daytona, one of the largest museums in Florida, uh, Smithsonian affiliate. We have just everything you can think of, train cars, race cars, a giant ground sloth, who knew? And these giant ground sloths that uh, roamed Florida long ago. Um, but we had a planetarium, uh, at our facility for close to 50 years. And so I run the planetarium. I do the shows, star shows, um, shows for field trips, um, uh, curate the, the space and art, or the space arts and space flight exhibits that we have, um, astronomy exhibits that we do. Uh, Derek, you had one with us recently, right? I did, yeah. Capturing the cosmos with That's his right. astrophotography. So we had a joint uh, exhibit that we put together. So we work with others on that, which was really cool. Uh, and we have an outreach program. We have a portable planetarium, a blow up dome that I travel all around Florida, teaching people about the wonders of the, of the universe or away from the museum. So I've uh, been there a long time. I love it. Uh, as I know all of us do, uh, it's just, it's a wonderful field to be in to, to kind of explore the universe. And like Derek said, yes, I, I, uh, I went to school to fly, but I always tell people now I just fly through the universe. And, and you are a great pilot tonight, Seth. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And uh, of course, Justin will be linking you all uh, the information uh, to Seth's planetarium and his museum. Definitely yeah, check it out once. Moas.org. Moas.org. And uh, hopefully, you'll be able, uh, we'll be able to check that very soon. All right. And so, uh, Bailey uh, had a quick question on, about the name of the sloth again. <laughs> the, the name of the sloth. I don't know if we've ever one? named it, but yeah, it's a giant ground sloth. Uh, Erotherium lora lorda, I know, is the, the Latin name for that. These giants. Really? It's like the three-toed sloth, uh, but much bigger. They're very big. More like elephant-sized version of a sloth. So we have a, a skeleton that was actually discovered three miles away uh, from the museum. Uh, they actually found multiple sloths and other ancient uh, animals uh, in Florida. We never had dinosaurs, but we had ancient mammals. Uh, mm -hmm. So um we uh, it's one of our features of our museum is a giant ground sloth so no official name really that we think of <laughs> all right so i think what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and uh look at another constellation i think um uh we're going to go ahead and head up towards the zenith this time we're going to go ahead and make our way to the top now the zenith is a term that we use for the highest part of the sky so you basically just kind of want to look straight up uh, and you'll see groups of constellations. And one of the things that uh, uh, John mentioned a little bit ago was the Nemean lion. And a lot of times uh, it's associated with a group of stars in the sky. And, and, and James, tell us a little bit about this, uh, this, uh, this lion in the sky that we have, uh, Leo. Yes, Leo the lion is one of those constellations that it's the most prominent one as 
far as being a springtime constellation. And its brightest star, as you can see there, it's star Regulus. Now, if you're having trouble finding it, if you can find the Big Dipper, Seth, zoom out just a little bit. Now, we're going to presume you're lying on your back. But if uh, we rotate the sky just a little bit, you'll see the Big Dipper over there toward the northeast. And it's well positioned in the sky for us in the northern hemisphere, even as far south as Florida. But you see those seven stars that make up the Big Dipper. The top two, uh, the top two point toward the North Star. So if you take Merak and Dubé and draw a straight line downward, you run into Polaris. But if you go to the other side and take Fecta and Megrez and yeah, Fecta and Megrez and go the other way, you run into a backwards question mark in the sky, and that is the head of Leo the Lion. And Regulus is the brightest star in the constellation, and Regulus means little king. And the backwards question mark, you have a couple of other bright stars like Algeba, which is right there. And that one marks the nape of the neck. And if you draw a line from going around to the curve, the last star on the very end is, let's see, it has several different names. This one's Algenubi, but sometimes it's referred, uh, Rosales is the one right before that one. Um, and again, all of these stars have Arabic names. Uh, so, if you take the, there are three stars behind that. If you draw a line from Al Janubi backward, you will actually run into a star called um, Zasma. Uh, Zasma is at the back. Well, that go all the way down. You see where Denebel is? It's the, just above the. Uh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, so that one's Zasma. That is kind of the back of the lion or near its rear. And then the bright one below that is Denebola. Deneb is, uh, means tail. So you'll have several stars in the sky that have that as their prefix. Deneb, the star Deneb itself is in the constellation of Cygnus and it's the tail of the swan. But you also have Deneb Algeti, which is the tail of Capricornus and Deneb Catos, which is the tail of the sea monster. So if you can actually form a triangle between Denebola, Zosma, and that third star there, and that one's Chertan. And Chertan is, makes up the last of the bright stars in the constellation. So Seth, you can bring up the, the constellation overlay. And that kind of gives you a good sense of uh, a lion in most cultures uh, around, particularly the Middle East and the, um, the Pearl Crescent, that area, they all had a lion in mind when they saw this constellation. And of course, uh, that, that lion is not the African lion that we think of, it's the Asiatic lion, which was actually very uh, dispersed throughout the Middle East and all the way into Greece and into Asia. But of course, there's only a few Asiatic lions left and that's in India at a national park in India. But there are, were a whole bunch of lions, a different uh, group of lions that uh, lived in that part of the world. Uh, now, um, Frank, uh, there is a, um, a really cool triplet of galaxies in Leo just below Zajma and Zertan, basically there's two stars in the, in, in, the, um, in the back of Leo. If you go down below it, you'll find a triplet of galaxies. And so you, actually we got a chance to take a look at these in uh, one of our events. But let's go ahead and just uh, point these galaxies out um, with, with a view through your telescope. Uh, do you happen to have uh, those, those images? I do. Let me uh, right. steal the screen. Let's take a look. And this is the Leo triplet of the galaxies. Yeah, Hopefully that's that. coming up. Yeah. And uh, yeah, these puppies are like 30 million light years away. It's kind of a mind-blowing distance. Um, and they're right next to each other, so it makes for a really pretty scene here. We have uh, the rather unsexily named M65 and M66, uh, but this guy on the left has a more interesting nickname, the Hamburger Galaxy. Hamburger. Mm, yep. yes. mm, makes, hungry. Us, makes us all hungry, right? Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. and don't worry, Justin, we have a Beyond Burger for you, our, our, our vegetarian. Ah, excellent. No, <laughs> so, they um, actually taste and, better. Yeah, they do, they do taste really good. I, I won't lie on that. And what's really neat about the, the Leo triplet is you get a chance to see different types of galaxies uh, in that you have um, a, a barred spiral on the bottom with uh, with M65, uh, or M6, and then we have M66, uh, and then we have the Hamburger Galaxy, which actually is edge on. But what's really cool is between M66 and 65, they're actually gravitationally pulling the uh, the, the the outer layers of that 
that hamburger galaxy creating that kind of warpness to it which is really really neat um, so this is kind of the more famous groups of objects uh, that you can look at in leo and we encourage you if you have a telescope to go outside and try to find these you can see these in fairly uh you know not you don't need truly truly dark skies to see them oh more so uh for m65 and m66 for the uh, Hamburg galaxy, you will need a little bit darker skies to see that, but definitely the two brighter galaxies. Uh, Derek, I wanted to point out one other thing about uh, Leo. Yeah. Is Regulus is right on what we call the ecliptic. And the ecliptic is that imaginary path the sun traces to the sky during the course of the year. So not only do, does the sun go through that constellation, hmm. but you have planets uh, very close to it, and the moon will occasionally occult it. But the moon's orbit is tilted by about five degrees with respect to the ecliptic, so it doesn't occult it very often. But there have been some archaeoastronomers that have looked back in time, and there have been multiple conjunctions with Regulus, and uh, in particular Jupiter and Venus and so forth. So that's something that you should always uh, try to look forward to. Um, we recently had Venus on the uh, ecliptic and it went through the Pleiades not too long ago. Um, so, but yeah, lots so. Of, definitely lots of really great um, things to look at and the sky is always changing. Um, now I'm gonna, now John, there's actually several different constellations around Leo um, that have some really great stories. And so I'm gonna give you a chance to not only talk about Leo, but maybe some of the other more obscure constellations around it. I know you mentioned uh, some of the other interesting objects in that part of the sky. So I mentioned that Leo was the Nemean lion, and in mythology, uh, the story is that it jumped down from the moon and then landed in the countryside of Nemea and terrorized everybody. Apparently, it could breathe fire. Who knew? And so the first labor that Hercules had to perform as a penance for doing something really bad. Uh, that his cousin, King Eurystheus, sent him on was to vanquish this lion. And it turned out that the lion was pretty hard to vanquish because uh, arrows shot at it would just bounce off of its skin. And the, the club he had wouldn't work and the sword wouldn't work. So he ended up wrestling the thing for like about 30 days. And finally, the, he pooped out the lion. It was just like exhausted. So he dragged its sorry carcass up into the sky. Well, first he took it into King Eurystheus but when he saw the dead lion, panicked and jumped into a big old jar and made him take it out of the palace. So Hercules carried it up into the sky. The second labor was to take care of a swamp monster known as the Lernian Hydra. And the Hydra stars are just down below uh, uh, Leo. And also at the same time, there's the head of Hydra. And that bright star that you see just at the neck is uh, called um, Alfard which means the solitary one that marks the heart of the hydra. And as most people know from the mythology, cut off one head, two more grow in its place. So um, he had a hard time getting rid of this hydra, except that he had some help from a nephew whose name was uh, Aeolus. And the, they came up with a plan where Hercules would lop off a head, and Aeolus took this big old tree trunk stump that Hercules pulled up on the ground, set it on fire, and he would cauterize the wound so a head couldn't regrow in that spot. They lopped off all the heads, cauterized everything, took the last head, which was immortal, buried it under a rock, and that was the end of Hydra. But just a little bit to the um, east of Leo, before you get to Gemini, is a very dark part of the sky, just above the Hydra's head. And that's Cancer the Crab. Cancer was also part of the second labor. Uh, Hera, uh, queen of the gods, who had sent to uh, made Hercules go mad, which caused the problems in the first place. She also sent a crab to pester Hercules while he was trying to take care of the hydra. Well, Hercules was kind of up to his, his hips and hydra heads. He didn't have any time to spare to fight the crab, so he just picked up and whatever was stomping on it, he, he was just pinching his heel. He stomped down and, you know, poor, poor cancer was crab meat. So Hera, what she did was she put cancer up in the sky as a reward for having decided, having volunteered to take on Hercules, but because he failed, um, he made the, the, she made the stars very faint. So that's in there. Uh, oh, uh, before I go on with more mythology, you might want to talk about the Presepi star cluster, because that's in mm -hmm. 
cancer. Yeah, so, uh, so, so Frank, uh, located in the center of cancer is a really beautiful open star cluster. And uh, I believe we, we also have recently taken an image of this star cluster as well through your telescope. I do not have that handy, but if you give you me do not have that handy. handy. Oh, <laughs> no, that was not. You're going off script, Eric. <laughs> ah, well, we, you know, sometimes we have to, sometimes we have to go with the flow. Um, but uh, <laughs> how many stars? What's that? Recepi is an old Latin word. It means the manger. And uh, during the 15, 16, and even 1700s, a lot of the constellations were uh, biblicized or, or Christianized, so that Leo the lion became the lion that was in the den with Daniel. And um, when you look at Cancer the Crab, the, the, the Persepi was the star cluster, was the manger. And there's two faint stars above and below it, known as, oh gosh, Acellus borealis and Acellus australis, which means northern donkey and southern donkey. So the nativity scene was laid out in that one little constellation there of Cancer. So, all right, okay, all you right. It. Well, you got it, you got it, Frank? Okay. More popular than yeah. More popular Do you request. Yeah. All right, we got we got a live request here uh, of the uh, target. There it is. There it is. Our I assume this is the one you're talking about, right? The beehive. Yep. All right. There it is. A beautiful young cluster of stars, uh, very dispersed compared to the Pleiades and some of the other star clusters that we have in the sky. Um, and um, you know, you need a fairly wide field of view. This is a great target to look at with a pair of binoculars. Um, so you definitely uh, don't need to have a big telescope in order to actually see this star cluster. And under dark skies, you can actually pick out almost kind of a faint fuzzy material in Cancer, and that of course is the beehive. Um, so I think this is a wonderful uh, image of the beehive, Frank. Thank you for picking that out. Uh, yeah. Now we're gonna we're gonna kind of go back on script here. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, what shall we? Uh, well, I'll, I'll let you let some of you steer. The next, uh, James, oh, actually, before we move on to our next constellation, uh, James, we're going to give you a chance to talk about your facility uh, and what you do. Hello, thank you very much. Well, and yeah, James, I'm James Alger. I'm the manager of the Kika Silva Planetarium at Santa Fe College. In Santa Fe College, we're in Gainesville, Florida, uh, not to be confused with Santa Fe, New Mexico. That, that happens every once in a while. But our planetarium was named after one of our benefactors' mother, uh, John Pla. His uh, mom was very active in the community, uh, and she loved astronomy. So when John and his wife Amy Howard donated money to Santa Fe College to have the planetarium completed, they wanted to name it in her honor. And I had an opportunity to meet her when she visited our planetarium for her 89th birthday. And it's not often that you get to meet the namesake of your planetarium, as most of us. Uh, I've realized. Seth, you, I don't know if you, now that you have a new name, and Brett, your names keep changing. <laughs> were, were, weren't you the Alexander Breast Planetarium for a while? We still technically are. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and Emil Bueller, there are two Buellers in Florida. Yes, but we're the M Emil Bueller. There's the Bueller Planetarium, but we're mm -hmm. the Emil Bueller. We've got to differentiate ourselves that way. Oh, okay. Kind of like how there are multiple Haydens. Exactly. Yeah. Luckily, we're the only Loman planetarium, so. Yeah, for, yeah. for now, for now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, we see about between 6,000 and 7,000 school children at our planetarium. We have a 34-foot dome, which is about a little over 10 meters, and we have 60 seats. We have a Goto Kronos star projector, and we have a digital projection system as well. And I haven't been in my planetarium for a month. I miss it a lot, but. I think we all <laughs> miss our planetariums, but I'm glad that we're able to be here uh, tonight and uh, James, you also host uh, a, a, a YouTube uh, program. Okay, yeah. So, um, um, as some of you know, I used to work at the Miami Space Transit Planetarium as a youngster, and I worked there from when I was 14 till I was about 21. So and I went to UF to I went to UF to get my degree in astronomy, so one day I could direct a planetarium. Uh, and in my travels, when I first became director of the planetarium in Gainesville, I was offered an opportunity to be the guest host on. Jack Horkheimer's Stargazers, um, which is a show I used to watch when I was little. I was 10 years old when the show started. And we used to watch Jack Horkheimer. He was a local celebrity in Miami. But in the mid 80s, uh, the show went national. So uh, he had a much greater following after that. And it's funny, he started wearing the toupee and we thought, well, that's pretty vain. But we found out 
<laughs> it was because of the green screening at the time. It wasn't very sophisticated, and the top of his head would disappear because he was oh. being bald. So, um, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, I had the opportunity of hosting his show after he had passed. He, uh, Dean Regas and I, we hosted the show together for nine years. Um, and when our term ended and they have a new host producers now, I decided to start my own program uh, called The Sky Above Us on YouTube. If we do a search on YouTube for The Sky Above Us or James Alberry, um, and I'll put, I have a whole group on Facebook that uh, we all watch episodes together and so forth. And we just posted the episode about Gemini uh, the other day. So, and now our upcoming episodes, there's going to be a cartoon version of me because I can't, you know, social distancing, I can't get near my video guy. So, uh, he's going to make an cartoon animated version, version of, me. of you. I'm really looking yeah. forward to seeing that. <laughs> that All right. Well, thank you, James. And uh, as before, Justin, we'll go ahead and put that information on the Facebook page. Um, we're going to take a little hot break and see if there's any questions from the, uh, from the group. Justin, do we have anybody, anybody have any questions for anybody? Yeah, we've got a few queued up here. Let's see. Um, we got a couple here for Frank real quick. Um, Douglas was asking uh, the images that you had uh, stacked there, were those true or false colors? Uh, depends which one we're talking about. Uh, so if we go back to the horse head and flame image, uh, that was that actually, was the one, uh, yes. that was a false color. So that is taken through narrow band filters. So we're looking at specific emissions of ionized hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And we're translating that into red, green, and blue colors in that image. It's not that different from how it actually looks you know, like IRL, um, but it does let us sort of like punch through the light pollution a little bit uh, easier doing it that way. All right. And uh, we had a couple questions, just some basic specs on the telescope. Oh, yeah. Um, so the scope I'm using here in Winter Springs is a uh, Skywatcher 190MN, which is a Mac Newtonian design on a Paramount MIT mount. And uh, for most of the pictures that I'm taking, the camera is going to be a uh, monochrome. Attic 383 L plus. Excellent. And I also posted the details of your page in the chat. So if anyone wants any more details on, uh, is it Scopey McScope face? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the name that we gave it. It's a little that's bit the dated these days. We're, we're looking for a new name, but yes, Scopey McScope face. If you have any suggestions, I think Frank is open to them, right? Frank? I am. Yes. All right. Bring so them if, on. You any, All right. if you have any names or suggestions for his scope, uh, we can christen it at the next star party. How about that? We can do that. There we go. Um, good, good. Excellent. Yeah. Art was asking, Derek, um, do other cultures have different constellation stories and names? Notice how John Bell just jumped up. Ready. Got this. He's ready. If you look at the Presepi star cluster, uh, there's an old Navajo story about a character named Longsash. He was the leader of his people. And this is a story you'd find out, actually predates the Navajo, goes back to the Anasazi. Uh, he uh, and his people <laughs> made their way up into the sky country. And when they, when they decided whether they would continue on up the Milky Way, they came to what was called the place of decision. These are two stars which are of about the same brightness and fairly close together. That's uh, Castor and Pollux over in the Gemini twins. And uh, when he uh, sat there on the rock, uh, his people had to make the choice whether they wanted to continue into the sky country or go back to Earth. And they ultimately decided to follow him into the sky country. And where he sat down, he rested his headdress. And that's the Presepi star cluster. Mm. That's a pretty cool. Uh... Pretty cool story there. Excellent. Yeah, from uh, this hemisphere, not from the old hemisphere. And 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 with Orion, it, there's a there's a very important element to. Oh, and it, Orion it, was long since. Orion was yeah. long since. Yeah, and, and 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 there's there's some Egyptian references to Orion. Osiris is one of them. Orion is Osiris um, in uh, Egyptian, and often he holds the star Aldebaran. And uh, if you take the belt of Orion and draw the line downward, it takes you to Sirius, which to the Egyptians was also known as Sothis or Isis who was the consort of Osiris. Uh, and uh, so that uh, Egyptian mythology is in there as well. Excellent. OK, Seth, let's go ahead and go back to our night sky. And uh, let's take a look at some of the uh, other constellations that we can see in our sky uh, tonight. Um, and we're, we're, about to, we're getting close on time here. So I think what we're going to do 
is we're going to go ahead and uh, take a look at the northern sky now. Um, so we looked at Orion, we looked at uh, Taurus, we looked at Sirius. But let's go ahead and over to uh, north. And let's take a look at some of the uh, constellations that are found in, uh, in the north, particularly the bears. So uh, James, can you talk a little bit about um, what we can see in both these areas of the sky, maybe some of the other constellations in that, in that region of the sky there? Yes. Alrighty. So there are three constellations I particularly like. The largest and most obvious one is Ursa Major, and the easiest way to find it is to look for the seven bright stars that make up the Big Dipper. Now, depending on where you grew up, the Big Dipper, you may not have referred to it as the Big Dipper. You may have referred to it as the Wagon, or the Butcher's Cleaver if you grew up in England, or the Casserole if you grew up in France, or the Plow if you grew up on a farm. For the seven bright stars, you have Dubé. If we start from the other end, you have Dubé. Uh, keep going. No, the Sorry. start of the bowl, the Sorry. brightest star in the bowl. All right. That's okay. There All you right. go. There you go. Nube, there you and go. then you have Murak. Yep. We're good. And then Fecta. Or the, yeah, it's sometimes Fad. called Fad. And then Megrez, and then Aliot, and then Mizar, and Alcade. And if you zoom in on Mizar, you will actually see two stars there. Now remember, there is a quiz on all these stars at the end of the virtual star party. So yes. hope all of you are listening closely. So, so one of the things about this particular star, if you have good eyesight and you are uh, in a dark sky, or particularly if you have glasses like I do, um, you may be able to see another star there. That star's name is Alcor. Alcor and Mizar are known as the horse and rider, and many, uh, many people use that as a test of eyesight, particularly Persian armies when they're recruiting their soldiers, they had them look for that other star, and if they could see both stars, they were given more responsibilities that um, required good eyesight. So, um, so if we zoom out a little bit, also if you're familiar with celestial navigation, a lot of people use the Big Dipper to help navigate because Dubé and Murak do point very close to the North Star. And some people, you may have heard of this as the drinking gourd, and that is what Harriet Tubman and other people who escaped slavery, they used the Big Dipper as their guide to head north because they knew that those two stars pointed to the North Star. So before we had GPS as people use the stars to navigate. Now Polaris has not always been our North Star. Um, Polaris is about 400 light years away and it is, uh, it's the 49th brightest star in the sky. So often people will say, oh well why isn't the North Star the brightest? Well the North Star is important because the Earth's axis of rotation points in that general direction right now. But because we tilt on our axis by about 23 and a half degrees, um, over time, the Earth is precessing like top. And as the top slows down, it begins to wobble. In physics, we call that precession. So it takes 26,000 years for it to make one complete wobble. So 5,000 years ago, that was not our North Star, Thuban was our North Star. Now, Thuban's a little harder to find. It's in Draco. Um, Seth, if that bright star yeah. between Kochab and find it in here. over sure. to the right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. bisect that Kochab and Kochab and draw a line to my, you got it. Yep, yeah. very good. So that was our North Star 5,000 years ago. Now, if you zoom out a little bit, um, uh, the stars of Cepheus look like they're setting, but right over to the left and down from Polaris is Eri, up, up right above North. Yeah. Yeah, down, okay. down a little bit, and oh, and over, over to the left. You Do you go. see that bright star? No, not that, that one. That one. one. Yeah. yeah, that is one of the stars of Cepheus. That will be our next north star in about two thousand years, between a thousand to two thousand years. I don't think I can wait that long. <laughs> <laughs> now um, we highlighted Draco. If we zoom out a little bit, Draco. I'm able to find Draco because Hercules is actually stepping on his head, and Hercules is right near the horizon over between the north and the east. So you'll see his, uh, he's sometimes called the kneeler because it looks like he's kneeling on the head of Draco. And the three bright stars there, you have Rastaban, which is the highest one uh, right under his foot, that's where his eye is. And then you have Eltanen or Ediman, which is the bright one that marks Draco's nose. And that's corner, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm pointing out. Draco. But that's how I find Draco at this time of year because I can find Hercules and then I can find those stars. And then El, um, Grumium. Uh, no, uh, the, yeah, I think it's Grumium, the one that makes the neck. 
uh, right at the neck yeah, of Draco. It's, it's grooming, yeah. Yeah, okay. So basically those stars curve all the way around between Ursa Minor and Ursa Major. Um, so yeah, that's a fun area of the sky. And I usually like, when I'm looking at Hercules, I usually try to look for the um, for M13, which is a nice little uh, globular cluster. Um, also, you can use the handle of the Big Dipper to find Arcturus. So since those are lit, all of those three stars around, and you can find Arcturus. That's the brightest star of Bootes, the herdsman. And then if you keep on going to the right, you'll speed up. Uh, we call it speed over to Spica. So that, that one is in Virgo. So you can find a whole bunch of stars in that same part of the sky. And hey, what's wrong with your bears? They got long tails. Yes, like well, that is a very good segue to John. And you, there's so many different stories about why the bears have long tails. I like to say that, well, I'll let you do Thereby that. Thereby hangs a tail, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. The, this is an ancient Greek myth where uh, the big bear was formerly a beautiful young lady named Callisto. And uh, Zeus took a liking to her and came down. They went out on dates. They went bowling together. Pretty soon they got married and settled down and they had a son named Arcus. Uh, the only problem with a happy little family life was that Zeus had forgotten he was already married and Mrs. Hera Zeus didn't care for the new Mrs. Zeus. So she came down to the earth one day and she, after a little bit of name calling and such with uh, Callisto, she let loose and turned poor Callisto into a grizzly bear. And thinking like a bear, Callisto goes off into the woods and we don't see her for a long time. Meanwhile, uh, Zeus couldn't find her, nobody could find her, uh, but Arcus grew up to become a young man. And he's out in the woods one day with bow and arrow and out comes a bear and immediately he pulls the arrow out, notches it, gets ready to shoot the bear. When to his horror, he discovers his hands are turning into claws and he himself is becoming a bear. And what had happened was Zeus had finally caught up with Callisto just as Arcus was about to shoot his own mother. He couldn't turn Callisto back into a woman again, so he did the next best thing and made Arcus another bear, a smaller bear, a little bear. So mother and son are reunited as bears. They gave each other a nice bear hug. And then Zeus realized that the, they were in danger of Hera's revenge. So he decided to put them up into the sky where she couldn't get at them. But the problem was, where do you pick up a bear? They're not thinking like people anymore. If you grab a bear by its ears, it's gonna bite you. If you grab it by its front legs and its paws, it's gonna scratch you. So Zeus studied on the problem from all ends and the answer finally hit him in the end, of course. He picked up the big bear by her little short stubby bear tail and lifted her up off the ground and spun her around and got her going pretty fast to reach escape velocity, about seven miles a second, by the way. And she sailed off into outer space. Then he went around to Arcus and picked him up by his little short, short tail and spun him around till he too was launched up into the heavens. And so there they are, the big bear and little bear, mother and son, Callisto and Arcus, up there with those long tails that they got because well, these bears were pretty heavy. And Zeus, when he picked them up by the tails, he stretched them out. And that's why they have those long tails in the sky. And I tell people that story and they, they think I'm stretching the tail a little bit. They find that story to be a bit unbearable. Oh. Bear us to hear it, but bear with me. There's grizzlier stories up there than that one. <laughs> ah, the super serious man is serious yeah. after yeah. all, huh? Well, let me, right. let me go, just do another spin on it. The funny thing is, so <laughs> it was a bear, a big bear to the Greeks, but also to uh, Native Americans. I grew up in the Finger Lakes and the Seneca uh, on the western door of the Iroquois Nation and the Mohawk on the eastern door both talked about Niagwehe. Niagwehe was this great bear that left its claw marks on the biggest elm trees around the village in the wintertime looking for food. So three hunters got together and they had to pursue the bear to chase it away from the village. And in the springtime, the bear is very high up in the sky and they're pursuing him. Instead of having the long tail, those three stars in the Big Dipper's handle become the three uh, heroes who chase after the bear. And the one in the middle, uh, the Mohawks say that he's got uh, sticks of wood to make a fire to cook the bear, but the Seneca say it's a small hunting dog running along beside. So they finally catch the bear as autumn is about to begin, and uh, the, the bear is wounded, and the blood drips down onto the leaves and stains them a red color, gives them those autumn fall colors. So the bear is defeated, and he goes down 
to the horizon. And here in Florida, he actually sinks below the horizon. I should say she sinks below the horizon. It's Callista after all. But then in the springtime, when late, late winter in the springtime, the dipper rises up again and the chase begins all over again. Now, that, so uh, I'm going to leave a story about Virgo uh, to me because my last name is Demeter or Demeter. Oh, yeah, you should. That's a good one. Um, and um, so Virgo uh, is seen as uh, the goddess uh, Demeter or Demeter. Depends on how you say it, tomato, tomato. But as a Demeter, I'm going to say Demeter. Uh, and she was the mother of Persephone. And eventually Persephone was taken down uh, to Hades to become the wife of the god of the underworld, Hades himself. Uh, but Demeter pleaded uh, with Hades to give uh, Persephone back to Demeter uh, for half the year. So when Virgo is up in the sky, the Greeks believe that that was when she was happy. She was with Persephone, life was coming back to the world, things were good. And then when the fall came, when uh, Virgo would start to set in the sky, that was when Persephone was given back to Hades and she became very sad and the world died uh, and stopped giving life and, and, and harvest. So, uh, so Virgo was actually used to the ancient Greeks as an indicator for when the growing season would begin and when harvest would have to start and we'd get ready for winter. So the stars are very important, uh, not only for telling stories and culture, but also to keep track of time. You know, they didn't have Google Calendar back then and then all that stuff to keep track of the world. They had to use the stars, as James mentioned. Now, uh, Frank, do we have any interesting uh, objects in this part of the sky that you've captured with your telescope? Yeah, we got plenty in that part of the sky. Uh, all right, let's take you know, a look at some of the cool stuff you've taken in these parts of the sky here. Well, uh, M13 came up earlier, so uh, let's uh, take a little look at that. Let All me right. share my screen. And while you're bringing that up, Frank, we got some questions about what you guys keep talking about, M this and M that. Who wants to tell our audience what this, this M stands for? Messier. Charles Messier. And who is this Charles Messier guy? I mean, that's just kind of opening another question. <laughs> he was French, I believe. He was a he, French astronomer from the 18th century. And uh, he was trying to dis, d, 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 tell the difference between comets and other mm -hmm. objects, looking for right. comets. So these fuzzy objects. So they, he started denoting things that weren't comets and uh, just going by number. You know, M1, 2, you know, M1 is uh, the supernova in, in uh, Taurus, right? The Crab Nebula. And they're these little fuzzy objects that you can see through a telescope. And so if you can dif differentiate between those and comets, and that can help you when you're looking for actual comets, these icy objects that enter our solar system. Uh, so that was uh, an old way of cataloging these kind of fuzzy objects uh, that, uh, what does it end on, 110, right? Or it's up it to 110 going? now, I think. Yeah. 110, yeah. This yeah, is like galaxy in the corner. Just the fuzzy objects that weren't comets that he, once he found them, he dismissed them, and he went looking for comets mainly. Yeah. So this is M13. This is a called the Hercules globular cluster. So uh, what is a globular cluster? Anybody want to answer that? Actually, Seth, since these other gentlemen have been answering questions and, and talking for a while, let's give you a chance yeah, to sure. answer this question. So there's, there's different types of clusters that you can find. We already talked about some open clusters, right? So Persepi, open cluster, Pleiades, open cluster. And uh, as we know, everything in the universe, you know, mass has gravity. And, or uh, uh, all mass in the universe has gravity. So things like to attract other things, right? So if you have enough of that stuff together, like stars, which are very big, uh, they can attract to each other uh, into these groups of stars. Actually, it turns out most stars are not alone. Our sun is kind of a loner being in its, you know, usually there's binary or trinary or quadruple star systems. But when you're talking about a lot of stars and all of their gravities kind of combined, they can kind of pull together into these huge structures, right? And globular clusters can have, you know, thousands and thousands of stars all bunched together. And uh, they're usually fairly old. Globular clusters are very old. You can see a lot of, uh, um, which can actually help you to understand the kind of evolution of that part of the universe when you're looking at the different stars that you can find inside globular clusters. And the Hercules cluster, or M13, right? So that would have been the 13th object that Charles Messier would have cataloged uh it was one of these and uh and inside hercules obviously very famous at least uh the name you know everyone knows hercules the name um so 
Uh, so yeah, they're these interesting objects where, uh, where there are a lot of stars bunched together. They're very old and can have tons and tons of stars. And just as Frank here has captured this, you can see just, you can't even count them, right? They're just like a smear of stars. There's so many of them, right? And you can even see star color too, and a lot of old red stars that live very long lives that you see there. So, um, so that's kind of the general way to describe globular clusters. And, and you can see the, you can see this globular cluster, even a pair of binoculars. And sometimes if you have really good skies, you can see this naked eye. Um, it looks like a fuzzy patch of light in the constellation of Hercules. So uh, Frank, um, uh, what else can we, what else can you show us from this a part of the sky? Well, we talked about Ursa Major a bit, so uh, we can talk about the Whirlpool right. Galaxy or the Pinwheel. Um, let's, let's take a look. All right, well, let's uh, take a look at the Pinwheel Galaxy next. Let me uh, share that one. And this is also known as M101, if I remember right. M Just kind of like, the yeah, that's right. All right. Uh, uh, so the Pinwheel Seth, Galaxy. So, so Brett, Seth, e either one of you want to take a stab at this? If not, Brett, I can, I can definitely take it. So, um, so this is a, an awesome galaxy. Uh, so you're seeing this galaxy face on, and of course, you know, galaxies are even bigger than globular clusters. So we're talking even more stars, millions, billions of stars. We live in the, you know, the Milky Way galaxy, right? And you might know some names like the Andromeda galaxy, different galaxies like that. And all those galaxies I've already mentioned are what are called spiral galaxies. Uh, and so you can see this kind of spiraling shape that you see here. Um, there's also elliptical galaxies, which are very round and like a ball, kind of a spherical kind of, you have irregular, weird shaped galaxies. So they come in these different shapes that can tell you kind of how old they are, how they've evolved over time. Galaxies like to merge and become elliptical galaxies, right? Um, so in this galaxy in particular, you can kind of see the, the swirling kind of uh, shape, uh, almost like water going down a drain. And in the center, in the galactic center, in the very middle, right there, um, is the, uh, there you go, on the mouse there, um, is uh, the, the galactic center, which you find giant black holes, something you uh, consistently find in galaxies, these giant, uh, very gravitationally powerful things in the centers of them. And so it's nice when they're face on like this, you can see the galaxy and its structure and its arms. And in those arms, you can find that, you know, a lot of times a lot of star formation kind of happening, uh, uh, flaring up in those arms. Uh, they're very interesting. So uh, this one in particular is, uh, is a favorite of mine. Excellent. And, and where in the sky actually is this galaxy? Uh, Seth, can you show us this? And while you're getting yeah, that let up me, there, uh, yeah, cue that up um, here, I want to go ahead and uh, give a shout out to John Bell's planetarium. So while he's getting that all set up, can you go ahead and talk a little bit about your planetarium, John? Right. This is the Hallstrom Planetarium. It's named for Ruth Hallstrom and also for her father, Axel Hallstrom. And uh, it was named for her. She was actually alive when we, we named the planetarium for her in 1995. The facility was built in 1993 here at Indian River State College on the Fort Pierce campus. Uh, so she actually attended a lot of the shows for those several years before she passed on. So it was great to have uh, patronage from the person for who your planetarium is named. Uh, we've been doing things uh, here for, well, I'm the first and so far the only planetarium director. Uh, so 27, almost 28 years now I've been here. I don't have a staff. So I try to do a lot of uh, school programs for school kids, K through 12, and public programs as well. Uh, we also have um, college students come through. So I teach astronomy. I'm an associate astronomy professor here at Indian River State. So I teach the astronomy as well. Uh, we've got um, a Skywatch program that I have on the local radio station public radio station. It's a one minute update, uh, Monday through Friday, a one minute spot uh, every week. And that's at WQCS. If you go to WQCS.org, you'll find the uh, transcripts and the podcast of Skywatch. And uh, the college's website is irsc.edu. And we don't really have a planetarium page right now. They've uh, they've remodeled the, the page and so the, the planetarium page just kind of got lost in the cracks there. So we're trying to put it back in there, but eventually you'll be able to reach us at irsc.edu. Okay, excellent, right. thank you, John. And, and so, oh, John's sorry. also the singing astronomer. And the singing astronomer. The singing astronomer, yes. And uh, so, 
Space <laughs> is the place that I would like to be out among the stars in our galaxy. There's two more verses. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe maybe at the very end before maybe we. Uh, all right, uh, All right. Seth, uh, what do we Yeah, have let's take a look. Let's go ahead and bring up the location of this yeah, object. Yeah, here you go. So for Pinwheel Galaxy here, so we're looking in the north here. We've already talked quite a bit about this area, so this works out really well with the handle, the Big Dipper, Little Dipper, and then that location right there, the Pinwheel Galaxy. I didn't mention uh, it's pretty uh, far away to 20 million light years away. Wow, that's and so crazy. the light takes 20 million years. Uh, to travel from that galaxy to reach our eyeballs or the camera, at least in Frank's sense, um, here on Earth, right? Uh, so it's just amazing um, that that these that these things can be seen from that distance away. So yeah, it's also a trillion stars in that thing too, which is also kind of mind blowing. Brilliant trillion stars. Yeah. All right, now um, we have been looking at Kama Atlas for uh, for quite a while now, and um, and unfortunately, I think this might end up being probably one of our last opportunities to really get a good view. Uh, Frank, have you had any luck with getting any images of Atlas in the last couple of days or week? Well, we've been uh, clouded in pretty badly here, but I do have an image from the virtual telescope project that we can look at that kind of okay, shows yeah. what's going on Take with look. it. Um, in fact, Got a few images here, so let me share my screen again. Now, uh, uh, since Brett, you're kind of the planetary guy, can you tell us a little about this comet that we're seeing? Well, <laughs> or what we're seeing, or what we were seeing, seeing yeah, yeah. Um, but I know very recently it looked like it's starting to disintegrate. In fact, I, I made the joke last time. Atlas shrugged, and <laughs> probably won't get much of a viewing of it, but. Typical comets, you know, they're frozen ice of different stuff. It's not just water ice, um, methane, nitrogen, all this stuff, because at distances, they're far out from the sun. It's extremely cold. And as they approach, they, they kind of um, light up like this. And that's the outgassing. It's literally the, the sublimation of the ice to gas flying out of space, making these tails. Um, this one, I honestly, I didn't have much hope for it to be a visible one, mainly because everyone was saying, this could be the comet of the, of the century <laughs> or comet of the year. And I'm like, that jinxed it. It's guaranteed it's not going to be anything special, probably. And sure enough, it looks like it's kind of fading away. Um, and it, it's, I don't even, it's, it's really below visibility, like naked eye visibility right now, I know. And I think it was going to be really close to being naked eye. Um, but now it doesn't look like it's going to be much of anything to see up there, unfortunately. You got the most recent pictures there? It's kind of a progression of it breaking apart here. So, you know, okay. back on April 6th, kind of the last time that we took a look at it on the show, you can see it's starting to dim already. And you can really see the fragmentation just getting worse and worse as the, uh, the days go on. And it's not even close to the sun yet. So as it gets closer and closer, it's just probably more and more disintegration is going to happen. Yeah, um, but I hear there's a comet swan coming up that uh, might be promising. We'll keep an eye on that one next. Yeah, so maybe we'll, yeah, we'll definitely try that for future uh, star parties. Um, so we only have just a little bit more time left, and we're going to go ahead and bring up the, uh, uh, Seth, you can bring up the morning sky. Yep. And while we do that, um, Justin, do we have any other questions while we bring up the morning sky? Yeah, absolutely. Um, hey, Seth, this one's for you from oh, cool. a uh, MOAS member. Yeah. Could you please explain why we see different constellations during the four seasons when the Earth stays leaning on its axis with North always pointing to Polaris? Wouldn't this continuous tilt let us see the same constellations all year round? Uh, it would, but we have the sun, right? The sun is uh, in our way, right, for the, the other half of the day. Uh, that's a great question, uh, and I'm glad they you know brought up the tilt and all that. And yes, to Earth is tilted at 23 and a half degrees, pointed uh, towards that North Star, or at least pretty near it, Polaris, right? Um, but we go around the Sun, and as we go around the Sun, the Sun basically is blocking our view of those objects. When you look towards the Sun, we'll never look towards the Sun, right? But when you're in that in the Very daytime important. sky, looking in that direction, uh, there are stars there still, right? Um, but we can't see them during the daytime. So you could see those stars all year round uh, if you, you know, at least if you're in the, you know, the equator of Earth, you know, all the stars from Earth, um, you could see them all year round. But the sun's glare blocks our view of those stars. So as we go around the sun, the sun looks like it's moving through the sky. And that's that term we brought up earlier, the ecliptic. 
uh, that's the apparent path the sun looks like it's moving. And of course, that's Earth going around the sun. And since we're doing that, the sun is in different parts of the sky. Actually, I can bring it up. You show that. You have a planetary program. I do have one, yes. Yeah. So here's the ecliptic <laughs> line. The of the universe right now. Yes, so. that's right. <laughs> so here is the, uh, the ecliptic, the apparent path the sun makes in the sky. And so it looks like the sun is charting a course through this, right? So we see stars on the other end of that at night, opposite of where the sun is uh, in the sky. I can actually turn off the ground here in Stellarium and kind of show that to you. So the, the ecliptic actually makes a big circle around us. And hey, there's the sun lying on the ecliptic. And so these stars are now around us. So there are still constellations around it that, uh, that the sun is kind of sitting in. And that actually brings up, we kind of talked a little bit about the zodiac signs, right? Mm -hmm. Those zodiac signs generally sit on the ecliptic line because that's the apparent path that the sun makes through those constellations. Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, we've already mentioned, Leo, Virgo, all of these. And as many of you know, uh, zodiac means circle of animals, except for one that's not an animal. <laughs> and that's Libra right here, right? Thanks, so that's why it's basically the sun's fault. Blame the sun that you can't see all the stars, or at least most of the stars um, on Earth. Now, again, if you're in the northern hemisphere on the North Pole, you'd only see the northern part of the sky. If you're in the South Pole, you'd only see the southern part of the sky. Uh, so they can only see that part because Earth actually blocks their view of stars either north or south of them. Um, so that's why the equator, if you're standing on the equator, you can see equal amount of north and south from there. And that's the reason why a lot of the biggest telescopes, telescopes in the world are fairly near the equator. That gives a bigger swath of the sky uh, to see. So, uh, so that's why you can't see all the constellations throughout, uh, uh, at least at, at a certain time of the year. Excellent, excellent. Um, Derek, this one's probably for you. Okay. Um, Bailey had asked, are there any red dwarf stars visible with a telescope? So red dwarf stars are fairly dim stars. Um, it's, it's much easier to view red dwarfs um, through, uh, through, through either very, very extremely large telescopes or through long exposures. Uh, so when we're mapping out red dwarfs, it's easier to actually uh, to, to, see, to see them uh, through um, through observing areas of the sky, and particularly uh, uh, through uh, photo photography. Um, usually when uh, we take long exposures, I know Frank and I take long exposures, we definitely see a lot more red, uh, smaller stars, very low luminosity. The, generally the bright red stars are generally bigger, uh, super giant type stars. Uh, so, but there's a lot of red giant, or excuse me, there's a lot of red dwarf stars out there actually. There's there's tons of them, and they're the oldest, uh, they're the longest running star. Some of these red dwarfs can be as old as 30 to 40 billion years, uh, or they can go on till then um, in terms of, so they're going to be around for a very long time because they're just not burning as, 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 as hot. They're kind of like the uh, fuel economy stars of the universe, if you will. You know, um, the, the Priuses of the, uh, <laughs> of the, of the, of the universe. That last um, remaining coal in your fireplace. Essentially, yes. So, um, so something that that's a really good, great question. Um, so, as we can see here, we are in the early morning sky, and, and if we can just go up a little bit ahead, because we want to talk about these uh, planets that we can see in the early morning. Some of you are getting up really early in the morning, right before sunrise, and also we can see that there is a beautiful moon up in the sky. So Brett, can you tell us a little bit about some of these objects that are in the sky? All right. Three planets and a moon all before sunrise. Um, makes a nice little grouping here. We got the little moon, there's the moon there. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I don't have my glasses on so I can't quite see the screen clear. <laughs> um, what the topmost planet should be Jupiter. That's right. Topmost. Top um, and that's the king planet, the biggest planet in our solar system. Um, even though it's a tiny little dot, it is you know, roughly half a billion miles away. So of course it's small, but large, reflecting a lot of light. And zooming into it, you can see it's really, really a colorful planet. Um, it's a type we call gas giant compared to, say, Earth, which is made of mostly rocks and metals. This is mostly hydrogen and helium, which is actually kind of like the sun. Um, same materials, but there's other gases here where the colors come from. Uh, in fact, that's a pretty cool up close there. You can see the famous storm of Jupiter, the, the great red spot. 
Um, and that truly is a massive storm. It is apparently going away. I, I've read different conflicts of it shrinking, but maybe not as much as it was, but maybe faster. That's still huge, though. Um, I'm trying to remember right now. It's roughly, what, 12, 15,000 miles wide? Can I remember? Yeah, a little bit bigger than Earth. A little bit bigger than Earth. Yeah. It's a little bigger than Earth, but, yeah, not quite as big as it had been in the past. Um, but being a ball of gas does mean, of course, we can't land on it. We could land on one of its moons, though, because, well, it has a lot of moons. Um, when I was a kid, it didn't have that many moons, <laughs> <laughs> but man, it's, it's increased. In fact, it's the past couple of years, it goes leapfrogging with another planet right now. Um, I had to write it down just to make sure I was remembering right. 79 moons. Yep. Second most of any planet. And it has some, and you can see the four big ones there. And of course this planet is most famous for being the first one viewed through a telescope by a famous guy from Italy. Anyone know who he is? Yep. Galileo, yeah. Galileo. <laughs> Galileo. Galileo. And those four moons are called the Galilean moons after him. And this actually helped us really kind of get an idea that Earth is not the center of the universe as much as some people think it is. Um, because those moons were going around Jupiter, not Earth. And that probably means other things weren't going around Earth. And that kind of gave us a new idea, a new insight to the entire universe. Just by looking at that was, what, 400 plus years ago? Mm -hmm. um, this was done, and those four big moons, if, if you even have a modest telescope or even a pretty good pair of binoculars, you can usually see those four big moons there. And um, let's see if I can remember the names. Callisto, Ganymede, Io, and Europa should be those four, right? Yes. I don't know by, I don't know by the order, though, <laughs> as they orbit here. Um, That's usually the most one. Okay. It depends on whether it's behind or in front of Jupiter. Right, right. Uh, like, again, I, I don't have my reading glasses on, so my screen's a little tiny I'm looking at. This goes outermost, then Ganymede, then Europa, and then Io. There you go. Um, and it's actually kind of cool, all four are visible. That's not always the case, because, again, they're orbiting. Sometimes they're behind it, and sometimes it's just the way it works. Um, but this is always a good view. And, and since it's just rising at sunrise, we're going to start seeing this more and more prominent as we move through spring into summer, and we'll start to get higher and higher. Um, now, right next to that planet, let me zoom out a little bit more, just below it, it's probably everyone's favorite planet to look at through a telescope. It was the first planet I looked at through a telescope. Famous green planet, Saturn. The most distant one you can see with your eyes. Um, sorry, Uranus, I don't believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but this I didn't believe in you either, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> this was the first one I looked up through a telescope, and I, I admit I saw that. I'm like that doesn't look real, and that's exactly what it looks like. Too. It just does not look real, um, and it's just a beautiful planet. And it's it's just like Jupiter, believe it or not. Mostly hydrogen, helium, gas here, different colors. Of course, the famous ring around it, um, not solid. Can't land on it. It's made of little tiny bits of ice. Most of the pieces can fit the palm of your hand. Um, There's some the size of mountains as well, though. We believe that's from some of the moons, and Saturn, of course, has the most moons with 82 moons, three three more <laughs> than <laughs> Jupiter. And this was a pretty recent add, too. Um, I was just, just last year, I think we added those moons, or about a year and a half ago. And I have to admit, Saturn has my most favorite moon in the entire solar system, by the way. Um, I don't know if, we have a, if you have a picture of it, anyone of Mimas? Mimas, oh. yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, good old Mimas. That's no moon. That's no moon. It's space that's station. No moon. That's right. What, what, what about, do we have a picture of it? If I can, it's like real close. I, I don't know. No, if I, 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 I don't know. I might be able to. There it is. Put it on the spot. I know. It, it, uh, no, it won't let me do it. Oh. <laughs> it's it's well, something. It has this nice, huge crater on it and makes this moon look exactly like the Death Star from Star Wars. Um, what I think is really hysterical is that that moon wasn't imaged until 1980. Mm -hmm. So it was three years earlier, Star Wars came out and the Death Star predated <laughs> Mimas and Mimas looks like the Death Star. And I think it's- I don't you know, know, we could start a conspiracy theory. We could, <laughs> we could start a conspiracy theory on that one. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. That's our, next, that's our next exploration point. Is Mimas really a moon? <laughs> and of course we had the very famous Cassini mission here. Um, over like, what, 13 years around Saturn exploring all its moons. 
Um, and Saturn's biggest moon, Titan, is the second largest. Jupiter has the biggest one in Ganymede. Uh, but Titan is the only moon with a significant atmosphere on it, which turns out to be kind of like the Earth in some ways, mostly made of nitrogen gas, about 98% or so nitrogen gas there. Um, and other things on it, too, that we still want to study about it. We did also land a probe on Titan, first and only time we've actually put a probe on the moon of another planet. That's a pretty huge, pretty huge thing to do. And we have future missions we want to go here now because during Cassini's mission, Enceladus completely blew our minds. We, we weren't expecting that one. Um, this is a moon that also has a water, liquid water, salt liquid water on it, uh, much like one of the moons of Jupiter called Europa. Um, Europa has a, a, a watery subsurface. It's underneath a frozen layer of ice. Enceladus does too. And liquid water, of course, is one of the things we look for. We look for life anywhere else. We think life has to have liquid water to survive. These two places have liquid water, but there's no guarantee there's life, but we want to find out more about it. And there's Enceladus, a little tiny little dot. Um, I occasionally call Enceladus enchiladas. Because <laughs> it makes it sound tastier. <laughs> All right, and then just below Saturn, we zoom back out. We've probably got the one you're going to hear a whole bunch about for years and years to come. Famous red planet. Mars. Mars. Your ominous Mars. red orb. Um, Mars really just, you can't miss it. Now, this planet's not too bright, though. Venus screams. Mars isn't bright. Um, it's just a little further away than Venus, too, because Mars is tiny. It's, it's like half the size of Earth. Um, so it's not going to reflect as much volume of light. Also, being farther from a sun than we are, it gets less light to reflect. And it's red. It's just not a super bright color reflecting back to us. But this planet, well, right now, it's, it's not a very nice planet, um, meaning it, it's kind of a frozen desert. Not dessert, desert. Um, <laughs> and we see lots of things that tell us that it wasn't always this way. Um, we've been sending robots to Mars for about 50 years now, and it, it's, the, the robots tell us that in the past, Mars was a very different planet covered with possibly oceans, which probably means it had a nice atmosphere on it too, because its atmosphere right now is very thin. We can't breathe it. It's mostly carbon dioxide. Um, and unlike Venus, which has a lot of carbon dioxide to make it hot, it's not enough to keep it warm here. But in the past, that was a different story because liquid water means warmer temperatures. So that's where this whole idea of were there Martians? I mean, possibly, we don't know. We want to go there and find out. And in the not too distant future, I mean, if things stay on track, it's in what, eight, nine years? Our first missions to man missions to Mars, or I should say people missions, because it's not always going to be probably planned. longer than that. Who knows what happened? What, what, how long? But who knows now? Yeah. Um, and Mars does have two little tiny moons around it as well. And speaking of moons, just below it is our lovely crescent of a moon. Um, now, this, this is why my moon is my favorite moon. I hate our moon because it's the second brightest thing in the sky. <laughs> when it's up there, it blocks everything else out. But right now, it is going away. You see the little crescent shape. Um, and you can always tell where the sun is because that crescent points towards the sun. That's how you can always find the sun. If you, for, for some reason, you can't find where the sun is, the crescent points to it. Um, and it's moving that way, too. So slowly it's going to go away. And these are these, the phases of the moon. Um, so in a few days, in fact, it's Tuesday, I think, is our new moon, which is awesome because what's happening Wednesday night? Anyone? Myrids. Myrids. Myrids in your shower. shower. That's yeah. right. No moon. <laughs> nice. And hopefully if it stays clear, we might have a pretty nice meteor shower to watch. Um, with no bright moon in the way, that's actually a good thing. And that, that rarely happens. It's always... Meteor showers would be like a full moon. And it's like, uh, always ruin it, moon. So I much prefer when there's no moon there. Of course, the moon comes and goes because it goes around the Earth. It takes a while. It takes actually about a month. In fact, the word month comes from that length of time. Um, it was originally month. Um, drop the O. And it's just the amount of time it takes to go around. It's around 29 and a half days to orbit the Earth once. And that does mean every once in a while you have a full moon up Earth. You might have a full moon in the end of the month, unless it's February. Even in a leap year, February is still too short by half a day to have that two full moons. And what do you, what do you call the second full moon of the month? Blue moon. Blue. Once in a blue moon, right? Second full moon of the month is what I call it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, blue, blue moon is a, it's technically not really a scientific term, is it? It's, it's kind of more of a, oh, it's different. It's just 
the second full moon of a month. But it can also refer to, was it four full moons in a three-month period of time? That might not necessarily, which would be a second full moon of a month, I know. But there's some really weird. And what's really funny is everyone thinks blue moons are rare, and they're, they're not. They're, they're actually, they happen quite often. Um, and also, my other, my other pet peeve, who loves super full moons? No. Oh. <laughs> No one likes that term, <laughs> super full moon, but you're going to hear it because the media likes to use that one. Um, in fact, I thought it was hysterical that we had two super full moons in a row, and they said each one was rare. <laughs> and they were literally back-to-back -back super full moons. How is that rare? I mean, I had two birthdays in a year. That's rare? <laughs> That's a common event then. So a uh, supermoon, it just means the orbit around the um, Earth isn't always the same distance. Sometimes a little closer, sometimes a little further. Um, so when it's closer, it looks bigger. And to be honest, most people won't even notice it. Um, it's like the difference between was it a nickel and a dime held at arm's length in size. So yeah, you're not going to see that. What I think is funny is no one makes up when the moon is furthest away from the sun. That's a micro moon. Mm -hmm. Or a wimpy moon. Like, yeah, that a wimpy moon. moon. Yeah, we'll go with that. Wimpy moon. <laughs> <laughs> Mini moon. Doesn't sound very. Doesn't sound very exciting though. Wimpy moon. No. I Brett. shall name you Mini Moon. <laughs> Brett, did um, later on this year, you see how Jupiter and Saturn are really close to each other. Yeah. Seth, would you be able to set the date for December twenty first, just before, after sunset? And yeah. Brett, could you tell our audience a little bit about what's going to happen with Saturn and Jupiter this year? It's, it's my favorite Schoolhouse Rock song. <laughs> oh, Sunset. Sunset, yep. Sorry. Sunset, yeah. yeah. Also, we got a perihelic opposition of Mars this autumn. It'll be nice and bright. Ooh. I honestly haven't looked this far ahead, but I think I know what we're going to. Where are we? Yep, that bright thing. Yeah, you see that bright thing right near the horizon? Yes, yes. I'll click yes. on it and then zoom in. Don't wait, don't wait. You went too fast. <laughs> okay, now zoom in. Ooh. Keep going. Whoa. Keep going. Keep it's going. Conjunction, junction. Oh, man, look at that. That's going to be incredible. <laughs> and it's going to be it's gonna awesome. Be it's going to be cloudy, though, that day. Of course. <laughs> yeah, just... Let's nobody hope it won't. Nobody, Frank, don't buy any, Frank, don't buy any telescope equipment. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> that's a that's an in thing for uh, in the it? amateur astronomy world is anybody who buys new equipment, it's going to be cloudy for a month. Uh, so don't buy any equipment, uh, you know. Yeah, that's actually uh, that's, why it's cloudy right now. I think that's the closest conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter in over 600 years. Wow. I'm not exactly sure of the date, but I mean, it, they're, Jupiter and Saturn are in, are in a orbital resonance with each other, so they do pass each other every yep. 19 years or so, but this one is super close. Yeah, and it, it's it, happening on the eighth anniversary of the end of the world after that Mayan thing. All right. Well, there we go. Oh, I still haven't recovered from that. Well, well guys, uh, we, are, uh, we are getting close to our end of our time here because um, otherwise we'll be talking about this stuff forever and uh, we would, um, but uh, we have to cut it, cut it up eventually. But uh, with that, I, you know, uh, Justin, is there any last, last uh, series of questions we can ask, uh, have our, uh, our guest here answer for us? We do actually, we've got two more and they're pretty good ones. Um, Laura asked about, this one I'll throw out to the whole team. Um, when we were looking at M13, mm -hmm. she had asked about exoplanets. What do we know about exoplanets and have we found anything in M13? I don't think we've found any exoplanets in any other galaxy, just stars. Well, M13 is part of the Milky Way. The, there well, was, uh, uh, what was it called? Nightfall. I think Asimov wrote a short story called Nightfall about a theoretical planet that was in a, 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 a star cluster, like a globular cluster. But the way it worked out with the orbit and the rotation of the planet was there was always at least one star. Oh, yeah. That was always daytime, except once in a while, they get these, this sort of a couple of, stars of uh, the stars would be below they're being eclipsed by a moon and then they could see the whole star cluster and everybody went crazy because it was like all those stars suddenly appearing but uh, when i took astronomy back a really long time ago the common thinking was that if you had a multiple star system 
two or three star system, then you wouldn't find any planets there because the orbits of the planets wouldn't be stable. They couldn't keep them for long. And since most star systems out there are multiple star systems, that meant that planets were kind of a rarity. And then we find planets going around Alpha Centauri, which is a three star system. And now suddenly we realize that uh, maybe we can have planets there too. So the chances of being planets in a globular cluster with all those complicated orbits, I wouldn't rule it out. It doesn't seem likely, but it does seem, I'm just not gonna say no at this point until we find out more. Yeah, also the, the age of the of globular clusters too usually lends to that if they had planets, they probably got eaten up at one point in, in the past. And usually uh, globular clusters tend to have very hydrogen rich stars, which probably wouldn't have the material the necessary to form the planets. Yeah. Um, or they would be very large gas planets like Jupiters and things like that. Um, but that's a great question. And, and I think very right good. now at the moment, there hasn't been anything discovered yet, but uh, that doesn't mean uh, in the future, somebody uh, that might be watching our program today might, might make that their uh, research project. And who knows, <laughs> maybe we'll, we'll find something. We've been surprised uh, how many stars have planets. We're, we're always getting right. surprised by that. And so, uh, you know, most of the stars in our sky turns out probably have planets. Uh, around them. So exoplanets are more common than we think, which is interesting prospects for life or, you know, if it exists or not, you know, out there uh, with so many planets that probably exist in the universe. Well, this question is from Art, and this is probably a perfect segue to the ending of the show. And um, Seth, you could probably start pulling this up uh, with a uh, view in Stellarium of our Milky Way sure. galaxy. Yeah. But he asked, what percentage of space are the constellations that we see? And Derek, you're probably perfect to answer that. So really, we only see about 3,000 light years worth of, of stars in our sky. Um, and we only see just a very small fraction of the stars in our Milky Way in terms of the night sky. Uh, but of course, if we look here, we can see the beautiful central region of our Milky Way. We can see several of the arms, like the Sagittarius arm, kind of off from the central region of our Milky Way. Um, but uh, of course, you know, um, we are only in one little blip of that midway. We're in what's called the Orion Spur, which is kind of an offshoot of the Perseus arm um, of our galaxy. And uh, we, we are just kind of in a cul-de-sac, a little tiny area of our galaxy. So our, our part of the sky only accounts for a very, very small percentage of the overall hundreds and hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy. So it's just amazing. When you go outside and you go out to a place where it's nice and dark and you look up at the sky and it's very important to go out somewhere where it's nice and dark away from the light pollution and look up and you can see that beautiful Milky Way band and, uh, and really truly feel connected to the grandeur of our, of our galaxy. And our galaxy, as you saw, is one of many galaxies that we see in the sky. We got a chance to look at some of them and Frank's gotten some really cool pictures of large, clusters of galaxies. And we looked at Virgo, which is a location of a very super cluster of galaxies. And, and you start to realize that there's just so much out there, it just blows your mind, right? So, um, you know, and, and we're still discovering more and more and more about our, of our universe each and every single day as we collect more data from objects. And so what I hope that you all do at some point, I hope these virtual star parties encourage you all to go outside and to look up at the stars and just be amazed by it. And uh, with that, I want to thank all of you uh, for joining us today uh, or tonight uh, and, and sharing your expertise and your passion. And uh, I hope that once this is all over, uh, that those that are watching here tonight, especially those that live in Florida, to please go and visit these awesome facilities um, and, and check out all the things they're doing. Uh, and we are really, really happy that you all were able to join us tonight for this event. And uh, just to let you all know about next week's uh, Star Party. So we're continuing these on as long as we can, as, and as, as, as long as we want. Uh, next Star Party at 9 p.m. is actually going to be, uh, so Frank, you kind of had it easy for the last couple of weeks, but don't worry. You're going to get involved in more next week because Frank had done some really cool research on weather patterns, especially here in Florida and other parts of the United States. And next week is all about how we can use forecasts 
and weather apps and things like that to kind of plan our star parties and looking at trends in terms of when and when's the best time to observe and how that actually links to potentially with things like climate change. Next week, as you know, is Earth is Earth Day, uh, is, and and um, and uh, we're going to celebrate that with some Earth related programs and uh, we hope that you're able to join us next Friday. Uh, but with that, what I'm going to do now is um, say a good night to all of you. And of course, again, thank you, John, James, Seth, and Brett for Brett, joining Brett. us tonight. And of course, thank you, Frank and Justin, for always being here as part of our main team of the Virtual Star Party. And with that, I'm going to let James say the famous motto uh, that he loves to say before we end this program. So James, you have the last, last hurrah with this famous motto that Jack Horkheimer has kind of brought up with, uh, with it. So go ahead, take it away, James. Okay, so all of this is great to see if you keep looking up. Yes, and keep looking up everybody. And I hope you have a great rest of your evening. And what we're going to do is we're going to stop the live stream for those that are watching Facebook Live. And with that, we're going to go ahead and stop our recording. And we hope to see you all again at a future virtual star party. Good night, everybody. Take care. Good night.